All right, so realistically, it took me far too long to get my black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. I started in 2005 and I had a bunch of gaps in my training, but also, honestly, I made a load of mistakes along the way. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about what I would do if I started in 2024 and how I'm training my current students to get their own black belts in a lot less time than it took me. Starting with number one, train with worse people. Okay, so when I was training at the Roger Gracie Academy, which obviously has a ton of high-level guys training at it, classes were split into regular and advanced. And advanced was only for people with three stripes on their blue belt and above and so when I got the third stripe on my blue I was like okay let's go we're gonna train properly now but obviously what actually happened was I got wrecked for about three months because almost everybody in that class was better than me and I'm not really sure that helped my training because here's the thing about training with people who are a lot better than you not only can you not work on the stuff you want to get better at you also don't get a ton of feedback on the stuff you are doing because sometimes nothing you do works. So maybe you're doing a hip escape or a scissor sweep in a way that kind of works fine against the other blue belts or white belts, but because you've still got some tiny holes in the movement and you're training against the brown belt who knows all the counters to what you're doing, you get smashed when you do it and it makes you lose confidence in the move and discourages you from trying it again. So of course you have to train with people who are better than you because it like does sharpen up your defense and it lets you know what good pressure and persistence and technique are supposed to feel like. But I also think there's a lot to be said for training with people who are worse than you because you can kind of steer rounds to the positions you want to work on and you get used to executing full techniques and you can kind of work on the things you want to work on. But crucially, this only really works if you do the next thing, which is forget trying to win roles. And listen, I understand wanting to win. When you start jujitsu, you spend a couple of months getting smashed by everyone else in the class and all you want to do is tap one person out somehow. Then when you finally manage it, you get that little rush of dopamine that means you want to do it again and again and again. But at a certain point, you have to move on from tapping out guys any way you can and work on the stuff that you actually want to improve. And so especially when you're training with people who are worse than you, one of the best ways to progress is to stop focusing on your A game and work on the moves and positions you're bad at, which means you're gonna to lose to people that you're normally competitive with. And what that really means is that you have to reframe the way you think about winning from getting taps to succeeding, troubleshooting, or even just trying the moves that you need to expand your game. And a good way to make that process more comfortable is prioritize escapes. And listen, everybody says this. Danaher says it, Roger says it, Craig Jones just deliberately gives up bad positions so he can humiliate everyone he rolls with. Escapes are just really important. And one reason they're important is because being able to escape from bad positions makes you a stronger attacker because you don't have to worry about getting stuck in a bad spot. If you can throw up an armbar or switch the K guard without worrying that you're gonna get stacked or passed, you're gonna get a lot more reps in those movements which means you're gonna to commit to them harder and be a better finisher. And again, escapes are something that you'll end up practicing a lot against people who are better than you, but I also recommend practicing them against people who are worse than you by letting them start in good positions and tweaking your movements until you're using the absolute minimum of strength to do them. And a good way to make sure those escapes are clean is drill for understanding. So when I started BJJ, there were a load of people who insisted that the best way to get good was to drill moves a ton until they become like almost second nature. And I still think there are basically two very good reasons to drill moves a lot. Firstly, when they're complicated, like the Baron Bola or the Imanari roll or a bunch of the 10th Planet stuff, you need to get a whole bunch of reps in just to make sure you're performing the movement properly. And secondly, when they're moves that you're likely to have a very small window of opportunity to hit really cleanly, like Andrew Wiltsy's buzzsaw knee slice. He's drilled that movement for thousands of reps and so now that means that if you even show him a little bit of an opportunity for an underhook, he's going to absolutely nail you with it. But for most moves, once you've got the hang of doing the movement itself, I think what you need to do is what Joseph Chen calls drilling for understanding. And this basically means getting your partner to vary the level of resistance they're offering and work on your understanding of the position. So they're not like going all out to stop you from doing the movement, but maybe they're trying to off balance you while you're doing it or framing instead of just lying there to make the reps slightly more realistic. And I think another good reason for this is that you're less likely to panic and freak out when you're trying the moves in a live role, which brings us nicely to play more games. So I've talked in another video about the value of positional sparring, but I think you can actually move quite a long way beyond that into games that work much more specific positions. So a really good example of this that Craig Jones gives is working on a drill where one partner hits a double leg takedown and then sparring starts from there because that's like a position you're actually likely to encounter in sparring from time to time. Or if you're starting in mount, then rather than starting like a classic positional sparring mount with no grips at all, Maybe you start with a cross face and an underhook because that's like a position you're likely to encounter anyway. So these games can often feel a little bit unbalanced and one person has like a better chance to win than the other one. But that's fine because they're games. It's not really about winning, it's about racking
racking up a bunch of time in the position so that you can explore lots of different options. And then the next level up from this, or down from it if you like, is playing games where the win-loss conditions are even more simplified and the rules are more artificial to kind of encourage everyone to find their own way to move in certain positions. So one that a lot of people will be familiar with is the knee touch game, where you start from standing and just try and touch the other person's knee, which is kind of a way to get used to setting up wrestling shots. But Rob Biernaki has a series of games called F Your Jiu Jitsu, where he doesn't allow you to do a lot of the movements that you'd most commonly do in Jiu Jitsu. So for instance, trying to stay on top of someone without keeping chest to chest contact, or trying to stop them from sweeping you without framing on any of their limbs. So the idea is that by reducing the options available, it narrows the field of things that you need to work on. And that leads us nicely to work on one thing at a time. So a huge thing that can happen in larger or less organized academies is that there are a bunch of different coaches taking like random classes and they just turn up and teach whatever they like on any given day with no like structure or way forward or way to like revise and remember stuff. So one day you're doing arm bars and then you're doing foot locks and then you don't go back to either of those things for weeks and you don't ever develop any kind of broader understanding of how they fit into the overall game. And this is definitely something that well-organized academies will have a system to deal with, either because they have a well-structured curriculum or because they devote entire weeks or months to like a specific position or situation so that you get a lot of time studying that one particular thing. But one thing that's really changed since I started is that there are a whole ton of resources online, and now it's possible to get really into the specifics of positions from YouTube or instructionals or online analysis or just talking to people on Reddit. But one thing I'd still really suggest is just focusing on one position or set of movements for at least long enough that you have a good set of options in it and a reasonably solid understanding of it. So for instance, this is something I've recently been doing with headquarters. It wasn't really a position I prioritized in the gi, but it's so helpful helpful in Nogi that I've been doing a ton of work from there and like developing all the passes that come out of it. And I find that a good measure of how well I understand a position is whether I can explain the fundamentals of it to somebody else and answer any questions they might have. And a good place to start with that is take better notes. So I actually took a ton of notes when I was a blue and purple belt, but I looked through them the other day and it's basically just a big long list of me describing movements that I've been taught with no kind of organizing principles to make them easy to refer back to. So now what I do is keep a set of different documents referring to different elements of different positions so that when I learn some like new trick or new aspect of the position, I can add them to one of those documents. And by having all of this in one kind of centrally organized repository, I can remind myself of what I've been working on and browse through to find movements that I've kind of forgotten that I might have tried before because sometimes a movement actually becomes more useful as you encounter different problems when your training partners improve. But something else that I find really useful is that rather than just writing down every detail of a movement or transcribing an instructional and posting screenshots, I also keep a notebook where I try to just scribble down the absolute fundamentals of a position because that kind of forces me to confront my own understanding of it and make sure I'm not just parroting something that somebody else has said. And if you want to know how I remember all this stuff once I've written it down, you can find a whole video about that right here. Thanks very much for watching.